All right, so um, happy to be here today. I'm going to be talking to you guys about serverless architecture, and I hope that by the end of this talk, uh, you'll have ideas of how to potentially use it in your upcoming projects and have a better understanding of what serverless is. Um, to start, I'm going to give a little bit of background about myself. So I'm a husband and a father. I have a beautiful one half year old daughter and a son in a couple of weeks. Hopefully my wife doesn't call me right now because she's about to give birth. Uh, <laughs> I'm also an engineer, as you might have guessed. Um, I started my career at IBM as a software engineer for performance testing in the uh, big data division, uh, primarily focused on on-premises applications. Um, I later on moved on to become a full stack developer, uh, working, on, working at Flip uh, under the coupons team. Um, also, I've been very interested in the crypto space for the last several years, uh, which led me to my next role at CoinSquare, where I helped build uh, the backend system that communicates between the front end and blockchain. Now, over the last seven, eight months, I've had the opportunity to co-found a company with two of my good friends uh, called uh, Mortgage. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So what is Mortgage? I'm gonna make an assumption that some of you here today have gone through a mortgage process. It is awful, it sucks, it's long, there's a lot of paperwork, you don't know what's going on up until the end, you hope you get the house. Um, and that's why we kinda uh, went ahead and built a mortgage. The real estate and mortgage space lacks innovation and it, it was time to change. So mortgage is a digital platform that simplifies the mortgage transaction. When we built it out, we predicated it on three different things. One, it had to be an intuitive platform. And what I mean by that is, uh, not only does it have to look good, but it also has to be uh, seamless and easy to use. So you're up and running under five minutes. Number two, it had to be fully integrated. Uh, the transaction, mortgage transaction involves a lot of data, so you have to make sure that with a click of a button, you have access to all that data. And finally, transparency. There's a lot of people that collaborate on the mortgage application, so we need to be able to make sure that everybody's aware, a client that's getting mortgage know what's going on, uh, similarly with the real estate agent, mortgage uh, agent, et cetera. So with that being said, um, as you can imagine, we deal with a ton of sensitive data, SIN numbers, uh, your uh, employment history, your address. Uh, so when we thought out how to build the platform, security was at top of mind. For background um, and for the remaining of the slides, we'll be referencing AWS. We are fully built in AWS uh, for a couple reasons. One, we're familiar with it. Uh, number two, the amount of services that they provide, how easy they integrate one another makes it that much easier uh, to build up. So with that background, I'll jump into what serverless computing is. So by definition, it's a cloud computing execution model where the cloud providers run the servers and manage them for you, and the allocation of machine resources essentially eliminating any IT infrastructure. So if you think about it, imagine there's a server in the cloud that all you had to do, you didn't have to set it up, all you had to do was write code, deploy it, and it executes. Now imagine you had to do it at a larger scale, you had to do, based on your needs, you had to do 50, 200, et cetera, that still exists, and you had to do zero work. All you had to do is write your code, and the rest is done by the cloud provider. So you don't have to worry about infrastructure, scaling up or down, et cetera. And the service that provides us with this, that I'll be referencing again throughout the slides is AWS Lambda. It's the, it's the service that allows you to write code, that gives you the capability of deploying your code to and executing it without doing much work. So, now that you have a, more, a better understanding of what serverless is, we have five key reasons why uh, we personally believe that you should use serverless, why we do use serverless. And the first one, going back to what I said, we deal with a ton of private data. So number one is security. And with security, we have three core components part of that, that, that make up that security. Uh, number one is each execution runs in isolation. So there's no overlap between another. Uh, number two, granular level permissions. So given that you write functions per se, uh, each one has the separation of responsibility. So you would assign the permissions needed for that specific lambda in this case uh, to access the data it needs, nothing else. And finally, there's no service to to. So we recently went through an Equifax audit uh, several months ago, and it was an interesting process because I don't think they've, or I believe they said that they've not done an audit with a company that's been pure serverless like we have. Uh, we spent about two hours educating them what serverless is because they wanted to find out how to assist you to the server. We told them we can't. And we kept going back and forth for two hours. Number two is cost efficiency. So as a startup, we started the company about seven, eight months ago. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money to spend. Um, so what serverless allows you to do is you never pay for idle time. You just pay for execution and that's it. There's no infrastructure to manage them, as I mentioned. Uh, everything is in the cloud, ready to set up for you, will scale up and down. All you have to do is write your code that will execute. And this allows us to do a quick start. So we're able to deploy code really quickly, uh, and there's multi-language support. So at Mortgage, we use Java, we use TypeScript and JavaScript. And with all those benefits in mind, there's little overhead. So we are able to run our, uh, our platform with Skeleton Crew, basically. 
Now, before I jump into how to use serverless, I broke it down into the building blocks. Think of them as Lego. So these are the different components that we assemble together to be able to build a, a small ecosystem or a service. Uh, Lambda being at the compute level, is, is, it is what provides serverless, and additionally these services uh, that uh, work with Lambda. I'm not gonna go into detail each one, but I will be when I go through the use cases uh, upcoming. And there's six use cases that I'd like to cover today, all of which we use a mortgage um, that, that serverless can, can make easier and better. Number one is APIs. Are uh, you all familiar with that? Building RESTful APIs, how can I serve data and consume data? Number two is A-B testing. Uh, something that a lot of companies do when releasing major, major features. Event-driven architecture, scheduled jobs, bulk jobs such as like data aggregation and analytics, and finally, uh, the website, which is the entirety of our platform. So jumping into the first example. So the building blocks required to create an API is actually pretty straightforward. All you need is the API gateway and a lambda. And in this case, uh, referencing back to mortgage, we have two use cases for exposing APIs when building them. One is to provide the APIs and the data to our platform. And number two is for our partners. Our partners need to be able to send us data, they need to be able to consume data. So in this simple example, think about it where I create my routes, my RESTful APIs uh, routes in API Gateway, and then I connect the routes that are dedicated to our platform to the Lambda number one, and the routes dedicated to partners to Lambda number two. With going back to granular level permissions, we've isolated each Lambda such that it only has access to the data that it needs. So there will be no overlap. A partner's Lambda that executes cannot have access to the same level of data that the other Lambda has access to. Event-driven. So we, we do a ton of um, event-driven executions, and uh, one of the examples is emails. So our mortgage brokers and uh, agents use our platform as a CRM. And uh, one of the ways they use it is they communicate with their clients, the person that is seeking a mortgage. There's two ways to go about that. One on one, as if you're sending through your Gmail app, and number two, through email marketing. So for example, doing last thousand emails. But in both those scenarios, you need to be able to store all the data that is associated with an email. That means if it was uh, opened, links clicked, uh, marked as spam, et cetera. And the building blocks required for that is we use SES, which is the email, email service uh, that Amazon provides to just send the emails, SNS, which acts as a pop up to be able to uh, send messages through, and Lambda to connect to, RDS is our database. So what happens is when an email gets fired, we embed a piece of code in it, and when that code or that event occurs, it notifies SES, which in turn publishes a message to SNS. And the reason there's two Lambdas here is because one is exposed to the outside world, where it will consume the message from SNS and modify the data however it needs. And then the second one is protected behind, not exposed to the outside world, where it will consume that updated message, persist it to the database. Schedule jobs. So we have a ton of schedule jobs. That's something as simple as reminders, follow-ups, even thumbnail generation. So when we do email marketing, when somebody updates, a client updates their email template, we need to be able to update, generate the thumbnail so it gets displayed on the front end. And uh, one way to go about it is using CloudWatch. So CloudWatch is typically used for logging, but they also have the ability to do time jobs using, using Cron Expressions. And when clients set up reminders, we need to make sure that they get the alert at 8 a.m. the day off, as well as 10 minutes before, similar to how your Google Calendar works. It's pretty straightforward. We just set up the Cron Expression, trigger the Lambda, and during those time frames, we execute on the data we have. So A-B testing, this one is actually one of my favorite ones only because it, we set it up in about 10 minutes. So we do a ton of feature releases and as a startup, uh, a lot of them uh, involve changing the front end drastically. And before we do that, we need to make sure that it resonates with our clients. So the way we, we set that up is our front end is also serverless. So it's statically hosted on S3. We use CloudFront as our CDN to serve it to our clients. And all we have to do is attach something called Lambda Edge into that CloudFront. Uh, with simple logic, you can do that with maybe two lines of code, like a coin flip, if they get heads, show them the website from S3. If they get tails, show them the website from uh, the bottom S3. And therefore, you can collect, you can run A-B tests and collect the metrics that you need. All right, so bulk jobs. Uh, that's actually one of my other interesting ones where we run a ton of uh, bulk jobs. One for data aggregation and collection. So we deal, we deal with a ton of data. So like, for example, interest rates. We need to make sure that the, those, those data are up to date. So we go out and fetch them uh, periodically, maybe once or twice every minute. But the second example for it is automated front-end testing. So traditionally, the way we built it is set up an EC2 instance, uh, deploy a couple of frameworks, and manage a queue of test cases, let's say in this case 500. What we were able to achieve with serverless is in parallel execute 500 test cases all at once, uh, and the results come back within a minute at a cost that is, that is insanely cheap. 
The only issue around it is Lambda has limitations, which I'll touch upon later, that requires us to put our headless browser, our Chromium instance in S3 and fetch it on, on uh, execution uh, due to how big it is. It's 200 megabytes. It adds only a couple hundred milliseconds uh, latency, but it's not bad. So for perspective, on the free tier, uh, we do about, like I said, 500 requests. They take about 30 seconds. We do once a day. That's about 15, 25,000 requests a month. We end up paying 86 cents a month versus what we had traditionally, which was 138. So it's 138 times uh, better than doing the digital way. Plus, you don't have to manage queuing. And the final example is our serverless website. So this is a more involved use case, but this is the entirety of our CRM system. Uh, like I said, the front end is statically hosted and the service as well, so we're entered through the front end. The back end as well right there is, as I said, serverless too. The only way to communicate with one another is through API Gateway. Uh, additionally here, even though there's a lot of security that is added to uh, Lambda out of the box, we added a VPC layer on top, so it's inaccessible to the outside world. That just adds a, another uh, layer of peace of mind so that we don't have to worry about uh, data being exposed. So what does this cost? What does this look like for us? And these are our actual monthly bills for them. So we compared it to what we had set up with an EC2 instance. We, like I said, do a, a typical day, a typical minute, we do over 550 live executions, that's API requests or box jobs, schedule jobs, whatever it may be. So that's about 24 million executions a month. That amounts to 460 in terms of requests. They're broken down by requests of compute. And by compute, we use a gig of memory per each. The average comes out to be 700 milliseconds. So all in all, we end up paying just under $300 versus the alternative of uh, almost $1,100. So to summarize, um, this is what I think serverless is. Uh, you just write code, zip it up, upload it, and it runs. You, there's no infrastructure, no, nothing to manage, no need for a DevOps team, etc. <laughs> so, with that, with that in mind, uh, from a limitations perspective, there are limitations with serverless that have existed majority, uh, majority of the life uh, of serverless. Uh, and the three key ones are deployment, cold start, and monitoring. From a deployment perspective, like I said, there's a 50 megabyte limit, at least in AWS. I believe Azure is unlimited, but you have to pay for storage, and uh, Google is 100 megabytes. But uh, running our AB, uh, AB test, not AB testing, sorry, the box jobs front end testing, we had to get creative, put the Chromium X in S3, and then fetch it only on execution. So we found ways around that. Additionally, we do tree shaking, so we get rid of un unused code and node packages. Given that we're node, uh, as some of you might know, node packages can blow up. So we get rid of code that is not used. As well as the other issue is coordinated deploy for services. So some lambdas uh, expect the other lambdas that they have to communicate with to have the latest code. So the way we go about that is we deploy certain stages and then flip the switch once the stages are up. From a cold start perspective, that's the most common limitation that everybody knows about. Because there's no instance that is always up, it takes time to boot up. And in our case, additionally, because we're behind a VPC and ENI uh, has to boot up to give it access to outside world, limited access to outside world, that can add to a couple of seconds. And the only way, unfortunately, to go about it right now is to periodically ping the high, or the, the, your most important lambdas to keep some containers up. And finally, monitoring. So uh, at Mortgage, we have over 65 lambdas. Um, and keeping track of all of them from a monitoring perspective can be very complicated. So what we do is we create our own Lambda that uh, goes and grabs the output of all the additional Lambdas, aggregates them, cleans up unnecessary noise, and, uh, and when we use that. So what's next for us in terms of serverless? So we're looking at three things over the next couple of months, most of which are recent. So we're looking at cross-service integration, and primarily for front-end testing. And the reason being is we don't have to, if we use uh, Google Cloud, uh, we won't have to worry about uh, fetching from an object storage in the Chromium instance. It will be bundled up in the package. Number two is AWS Firecracker. Uh, that was open source several months ago. It's the underlying technology that right now powers Lambda. It's a kernel-based VM that is heavily optimized for uh, uh, serverless. So we're trying to see if there's any internal use cases for it. And the last thing is WebSockets. So API Gateway added the capability of doing WebSockets several months ago. Uh, we're exploring using it for certain features of our website, uh, but keeping in mind that Cold Start is still an issue with uh, WebSockets. And then that's it. Any questions? Yeah, so we've had experience with CloudFormation. We partially used it. It had some issues uh, that we had where um, our integration between the API Gateway and the Lambda requires uh, what would they call a proxy integration. And they've had a couple of bugs in the past where they, it ex accidentally or unintentionally uh, removes that feature. So we're, we're working through the kicks with uh, AWS through that, uh, but primarily at CloudFormation.
What do you use to authenticate with partners? Yeah, so going back to, I'll go back to the building blocks. Um, we use Cognito, yeah. So what we try to do is, is house, warehouse everything in AWS, use the services they provide because they integrate together very seamlessly. So Cognito allows us to authenticate and also authorize uh, additional on top of it. So we expose API inputs to them, but we have to make sure that they're the right person that has access to them. Um, so from the business side, you're not like a kayak, you're not an aggregator of rates. Do you partner directly with the mortgage lenders or like are you pulling from their back end or what? How does that work? So, so as a user, I go in and I say, give me a good rate. How does that work? So we're not a consumer facing platform. We're primarily built for mortgage brokers and agents that will facilitate the transaction to you. We do have a consumer side where you would log in and view the whole process of your mortgage transaction end to end. Uh, where you'd upload your documents, fill, sign everything on it, uh, but we're not a rate comparison like Rado, for example. Gotcha. Um, from a security standpoint, is it built into your code or into uh, AWS? The restrictions between being able to see the data. Both. Both. So we 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 have we heavily utilize the AWS capability of doing granular level permissions. Yeah. So I'll give you perspective, like going back to uh, this slide. Uh, in the back end here, we have uh, access to either DynamoDB for uh, uh, document-based uh, storage, or we have access to RDS, both of which these lambdas either have access to specific tables in Dynamo, similarly have specific access to uh, tables in RDS. So those permissions are very uh, granular that uh, uh, that they can, they can only access what they need. Additionally, we do have application layer uh, validations on top of it. Given that you don't have local machinery, what's the most difficult part about developing and debugging serverless? Yeah, um, so we don't have like said local machines, so there's no, like as opposed to building like a simple node app in Express or Core that you can boot up and test. Um, we have a bunch of different ways, one of which we have, we ensure that every person has their own environment in the cloud that they can use to test on. Uh, additionally, we just have a small framework that we built in-house that allows you to execute specific routes as if they were invoked uh, externally. I'm just curious, it sounds like you at one point you weren't serverless, but then you became serverless. What was the role of like, at least with regards to your dev team, was there top lessons learned? So we, we, we primarily went uh, uh, directly into serverless, and that's out of experience. I've worked on uh, Microsoft's in the past for actually majority of uh, my years. Um, but the, the price you see is we had to spin up in the early days, like seven, eight months ago, we had to spin up both of them to evaluate from a cost perspective, because as a startup, we had to make sure that uh, we don't spend too much. And from a security perspective, given the level of data we, we deal with, uh, we had to make sure that that, that benefit is, is higher uh, for us. So uh, what uh, frameworks do you, do you use? Yeah, so we, we, we don't use any frameworks that are available publicly. We're looking at open sourcing some of the ones we do uh, use. They're all built in-house. Um, and I think that's part of the struggle of serverless as a whole in the industry, is that there's no educational aspect behind it. Um, it's not like where you can download boilerplate code. There are some products that exist, but it's not like the traditional download like a node boilerplate or Ruby, Unreal, etc., and, and write your code and execute it. When people set up a Lambda, they think they just can write code, but they don't know what to write as well. Um, so there's an educational piece behind it, and we're trying to find ways to make it easier for people to adopt, and, and that's partially where the use cases come from. Um, and we will be open sourcing some of the frameworks that we've built in-house. Uh, so when you were talking about cold starts with lambdas, eventually you will have to kind of every couple of minutes ping them to make sure they stay up. You know, but we might be in them. You just yeah. actually invoke the lambdas, tell it to skip all the code. Yeah. So um, what we do is, in the, like in this example, we use CloudWatch to trigger certain lambdas. Out of the sixty-five, there's only four that are critical to the business to have to be up every now and then. Um, essentially, render serverless useless per se is like having an EC2 instance that is up, but for us, that's still beneficial to use serverless given the security that is added on top. Uh, but what we do is periodically, yeah, like let's say every 30 seconds, we invoke it basically as a, like a ping. Uh, and, and, and it keeps a couple of containers up, depending on how many we need. Well, 
does that do to your classes or significant difference? No. So if you look at going back to if you do it and if you don't. Do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So if you look at how many requests you could do um, a month on the free tier, and again, the tiers that AWS provides is actually very enticing that they're not that expensive. You get a million requests a month, like in, uh, in folks, and a ping, you get about 136,000 seconds a month. A ping typically takes maybe 100 milliseconds. The cost per million is about 20 cents. So in terms of uh, uh, cost for us, it's actually negligible. Sorry, another question. I also noticed some of your uh, uh, diagrams that you also had your RDS right into Dynamo? No, no. So uh, Dynamo is outside. You can't, we didn't put Dynamo on a VPC. It just communicates with everything behind the VPC. In this case, Lambda. So Lambda communicates with Dynamo. Uh, similarly, uh, API Gateway communicates with Lambda. And just the Lambdas communicate with RDS alone. So curiosity, what goes into that? Like, what did you say? Sorry. Why did you say that? Because it's out of curiosity, what goes into that Dynamo? Oh, so we have some of our some of our uh, the way we see some of the data. Uh, it's it's better for performance to use a document store. Yeah, it's unstructured data, structured unstructured partially. Yeah. You say you have lambdas to keep track of your lambdas. How does that work exactly? Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't remember where that was. Oh, for, yeah, the monitoring, right? So we have a Lambda that goes in, so we spit out all the logs that come out of CloudWatch to Elasticsearch, and we have uh, a Lambda that goes in and filters through uh, all unnecessary noise. In this case, for example, ping, that's unnecessary noise that we don't need. It aggregates the logs across different Lambdas. Um, uh, we have, a, we have our, our own internal logger that we built uh, to make it easier, which is another thing we're looking to open source because Logging with serverless can be very complicated. It's across different instances, uh, and if you have different lambdas, you want to be able to trace through it. Um, so we have a custom logger that helps us. After aggregating all those stuff, it spits out into one stream. So every lambda has its own stream, or log group, per se. Um, we, we have to look at only one log group to see the whole picture of 65 lambdas. You mentioned uh, cleaning, up, cleaning up your code. Um, Tree shaking? Yeah, I forget why you said that. But how often do you how often do you do that? that? That's part of the deploy process. So we have a custom deploy process that parses through the entire code base and gets rid of code in node packages that are not needed because there's a lot of noise in node packages and they're huge. You can go into a couple hundred megs. Uh, so those utilities in those packages, let's say you download a package uh, like Lodash that has thousands of uh, functionalities and you only use two, we end up throwing away the 998. So if you don't control how much computation you actually do, what's stopping someone from saying just DDoSing your server and you end up paying millions? Yeah, so uh, one of the building blocks here that I did not show is we use AWS WAF uh, to fully protect us. So it, it, it's the added capability to connect that to uh, Lambda that protects against DDoS, uh, injections, etc. So it's a service that is provided by uh, AWS and I think the cost for us is about $20 a month. Uh, what are some applications which don't really cater to serverless, or do you believe all applications generally do? I don't. Um, it's it's kind of tough to say what um, ones should fit that I didn't put in the use case. Um, like you kind of have to try it out to see if it fits. I believe that potentially down the line, maybe five, ten years, as this evolves, because it's still I, I, I consider it in its infancy. Um, serverless that it will be the new programming paradigm. It requires a different mindset of when developing, as opposed to, like I said, downloading a node boilerplate, which traditionally uh, what people do. Also, the community, as it's growing, uh, there's a lot of things that have been fixed, uh, figured out, um, and that gives us a clear picture down the line. Um, but the use cases I, I display today is the ones we use, uh, which I think fit maybe to 60-70% of uh, today's web apps that exist.